Fallout is home to some of the most amazing and fascinating little tidbits of world building and lore that the game's medium has seen, and in many ways it's the main contributing factor behind the success of this now juggernaut of a franchise. From its most basic standpoint though, Fallout is based on an alternative timeline to our real world where up until the 1950s, things were pretty much exactly the same. But in the Fallout universe, humanity largely stayed stuck and attached to these atomic age ideals of the time. And because of this, much of the technological, aesthetic, and cultural growth over the following century remained draped in nostalgic perversion for this now long gone era. But during this time too, with the advent of the nuclear bomb and growing arsenals around the world, along with rising tensions between the United States of America and China, not all was looking good. In fact, by the year 2077, animosity between these two nations had reached a fever pitch, and resulted in the infamous Great War, which began on October 23rd of that year. Both China and the US launched almost their entire arsenal of nuclear weapons at each other at once, and in the crossfire, countless other nations and lives were lost across the world. And for anyone that was unlucky enough to have survived the initial blast, the nuclear fallout would have blackened the sky above and caused extreme cold and despair along with mutating animal and human DNA alike into strange and otherworldly creatures. And even hundreds of years later, the now almost unrecognizable Earth, now known as the Wasteland, would be home to copious amounts of murder and evil, a quite literal hell on Earth for those of us still alive. However, maybe the most interesting part about the whole series isn't actually the bombs falling, but all the implications around it. And that's because before the Great War began, a mega corporation known as vault -Tec secretly in cahoots with the United States government, had set up 122 underground vault facilities that were meant to house and protect innocent civilians in the event that the bombs did fall. On the surface, these vaults were marked as safe houses in the event of catastrophe that simply served as shelters for food, water, and housing, along with a lot of community, all of which could be maintained for hundreds of years post the bombs falling. But behind this facade lied a much darker secret, because the vaults were actually being used as a set of testing facilities on human experimentation and torture. And in the first season of the Fallout TV show, it was even revealed that vault Tech themselves intended to drop the bombs first at the start of the Great War, that way they could force innocent people into the vaults to run experiments on them for their own sick pleasure, and also the promise of a monopoly over the world and its people hundreds of years later. And some of these experiments were truly heinous, like pumping white noise or toxic gases into these vaults where no one could escape, murdering mothers and fathers and then using their children as lab rats in genetic mutation, only to kill off those not physically or mentally strong enough in front of other children. Or even trapping residents inside virtual reality simulators where the overseer or leader of the vault could kill them over and over again only to wipe their memories and start all over. The strange and dark things that happened in these vaults are truly unimaginable imaginable, but also some of the most oddly fascinating stories to dive into, and without a doubt, they're what make the lore of Fallout so recognizable and ubiquitous, so much so that I actually even made a two hour long video going in depth into every single vault we know about, so feel free to check that out too if you're interested. And overall, these vaults played a key role in every game, as they serve not only as the starting place, but also locations to find endless lore and intrigue to dive into in this series. And on top of this, there's so much more other lore in this series as well that takes it to the next level. Like the Brotherhood of Steel, who are a splinter faction of the old United States military that is formed into a techno-fascist regime of sorts that scours the states looking for pre-war technology that they can hoard for themselves. Or what about the Enclave, the remnants of the highest levels of the government who are now shrouded in secrecy but may even have been the key people that started the Great War, all in a bid to escape from Earth on a massive spaceship and find a new home planet after they knew the world was doomed from upcoming nuclear annihilation. Some of the older lore revealed from the original creators of the series even paint some potential pictures where the Enclave themselves may have been behind the vaults and the reason the experiment seems so random and over the top is because all of these experiments were being done to help with deep space exploration for elites who knew the world would end. 
And just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, there are even other problems in the wasteland years after the devastation, like the proliferation of FEV or the forced evolutionary virus, which was created in lab testing trying to develop human resistances to Chinese synthetic contagions, which resulted in a virus that can literally change human DNA and mutate us into giant horrific monsters that eat human flesh and shout obscenities. Overall, Fallout is as insane and depressing as it is wacky and whimsical, and the endless gore and killing in conjunction with the happy robots and 50s era charm results in a world that is unlike anything else out there with some of the coolest and deepest lore you can find. The Fallout series is no stranger to absolutely shocking, absurd, and thought-provoking encounters. Be it cannibals hiding in plain sight, a cult worshipping an atomic god that praises them with a radiation poisoning, or any of the numerous twisted and sinister vaults full of experimentation on live human beings. But maybe the most riveting and legendary quest of them all comes from Fallout 3 with a questline titled Oasis. You see, Fallout 3 especially is known for its drab color palette and never-ending sense of dread and doom everywhere you go in the world. But if you happen to be wandering in one specific section of the map, you may stumble upon what seems to be little ferns and green plants starting to pop up all around the area. So if you follow this trail of growth, you eventually end up at what is known as Oasis, a sprawling town full of healthy and growing plant life along with a series of cultists. And as anyone who's played the game knows, this is a really fascinating moment because for the first time in your entire playthrough, you actually get to be in a place that isn't defined by drab dirt and abandoned buildings. It's a huge change of pace. But once inside, you speak to a man known as Tree Father Birch, who along with other cultists keeps telling you about this strange quote unquote he who has been calling you to their colony and that you will need to drink from the sap in order to speak to him. If you decide to do so, you're eventually led to none other than Harold the source of all the flourishing plant life, an ancient talking tree that has suffered from massive radiation poisoning after the bombs fell and mutated, and also a character we originally met in Fallout 2. If you speak to him, Harold expresses his need to die, how he has struggled for hundreds of years now being stuck in this one spot at no fault of his own, and even in his speech you can see that he is starting to go crazy with boredom and sadness. He tells you that deep underground beneath him lies his heart, and that you need to destroy it in order for him to finally be set free from his eternal prison. But things aren't so simple, because after this when you go back to talk to Tree Father Birch and another cultist named Laurel, you learn that the colony is actually split on what to do. Some want to apply a birch sap to Harold in order to stop his growth but keep him alive, maintaining the secret of the village while also maintaining the prosperity they've had. Others want to apply a liniment to Harold, which would only accelerate his growth and potentially, with it, the rebirth of a flourishing world. And if you're especially evil, you can even decide to now take your flamethrower out and burn Harold alive at this point, watching him scream in agony while the cultists attack you in rage. Regardless of the choice you make though, this quest is so interesting because of the grey moral choices it provides. If you decide to fulfill Harold's wish and destroy his heart deep underground, you might be dooming the lives of not only these strange hippie cultists, but potentially millions of others that would have survived with a world full of regrown forests like this. But if you choose to keep Harold alive for the cultists, or even the world's benefit, you are dooming this poor creature to an eternity of hell that he doesn't even fully understand. And this question only gets further complicated by the fact that if you speak to Harold more, you learn that he is slowly gaining power from the trees around him, being able to hear and see from their branches, implying he is gaining more and more authority over time. So maybe even that proposed utopia of the future would actually be nothing more than a nightmare forest run by a tyrant tree with a vendetta. The choice of what to do now becomes extremely hard to make, and it really forces the player to sit back and think about what to do next. This isn't a simple question of should I be evil and blow up a city with a nuke inside of it, or should I be a goody two-shoes and leave it unarmed? This quest really has no right answers, and makes us ponder about the needs of the many over the needs of the few and the implications of each. And being able to just explore the area and talk to lots of townsfolk about this conundrum is just such a fun way to set up this whole adventure. 
nature. For example, if you speak to a young girl named Sapling Yu, she will tell you about how she always talks with Harold and tries to keep him company. And if you speak to Harold about her, he almost starts to look and sound happy for a moment, feeling at ease knowing someone out there really cares about him and his well-being. It really is just Fallout at its best, which is ironic considering this is one of the least Fallout adjacent locations in the entire series, full of greenery, happiness, and flourishing life. And even all of the different endings you can get here really make you stand back and think about what happened. Like one where you can side with the townspeople and help Harold grow more, only for him to feel guilty about his request before, saying it was his duty to help people survive and not be selfish. Which implies killing him before may have been the wrong choice after all, but we'll never really know. Regardless though, it stands as one of the most legendary quests of all time, and a series that seems to produce so many. The Fallout series is not only one of the biggest franchises out there right now, but also one of the most mysterious. And while that mystery comes from all over the place, including the vaults and their heinous backstories, the questions of who really dropped the bombs and the theories around the war, to whether or not the teddy bears from Fallout 4 are actually watching us the entire time, out of every mystery in Fallout, one of the best is a specific place we get to visit in the third game, that not only has connections to many other Fallout titles, but also is home to some of the biggest secrets the series has to offer, the Dunwich Building. Located in the southwestern corner of the Fallout 3 map, west of the infamous Tenpenny Tower, the Dunwich Building at a glance is nothing special. It's your run-of-the-mill abandoned office building in the wasteland with shattered windows and a burned-out roofing unit. But the closer you look inside this disheveled structure, the crazier things get. On the first floor when you walk in, it becomes clear that the entire building has been decimated, and in the rubble now lies a host of feral ghouls that will attack you on sight, along with an assortment of different audio logs and journal entries that detail the life of different survivors that have tried to call this place home. The more you listen to these recordings though, the clearer it becomes that a lot more than meets the eye is happening in this building. Previous inhabitants like Jamie can be heard slowly descending into madness, whispering in tongues and seemingly giving themselves over to some sort of higher power, a power we have yet to see or hear about. And as you traverse this ruined building more and more, a broken set of passageways can be discovered that lead deeper beneath the building full of more audio logs and environmental storytelling, which all culminates in one horrifying discovery. Deep underground beneath the Dunwich building lies what is known as the Under Chambers, a small chasm littered with feral ghouls, all surrounding an obelisk in the center, which sings a soothing hum while spewing out an unbelievable amount of toxic radiation. One of the ghouls in the middle is none other than Jamie, who you heard on those lost audio logs, and if provoked, he will start to somehow order the feral ghouls to attack, resulting in an all-out brawl and utter carnage. Somehow, the ghouls in this building were not only being controlled, but were apparently praying to this obelisk, gathered around it like monks when we first find them, and considering that feral ghouls are supposed to be mindless killing machines, this discovery is quite unique. However, even more horrifying, if you turn up your in-game ambient sound volume high enough, the echoes of an eerie voice can be heard, beckoning the player to surrender themselves to find salvation. Something obviously nefarious is going on in the Dunwich building, but as to what that is, we still don't exactly know. If you search through the terminal entries in-game and across newer Fallout titles, it can be deduced that the Dunwich building is actually an office of operations for a group known as the Dunwich Boars, a company that manufactures rock drills for large tunneling operations. In Fallout 4, we even get a glimpse into one of these massive operations firsthand, which includes strange hallucinations and voices very similar to the kind we encounter in the Dunwich building as well. Theories on what is happening here range from demonic possession to top secret scientific research from before the Great War even began and the bombs fell. But the actual culprit is one that we can read about in now countless terminal entries regarding the Dunwich Boars, Ugletoth. Regarded as some sort of mythological or supernatural entity, the Eldritch Being was supposedly a force that was being studied even before the Great War between the United States and China in Fallout, and is said to have powers of mind control, time manipulation, and matter deconstruction. The Dunwich Boar Company from its onset was actually a front to study this creature further, and the obelisk we find underneath the office building is actually a discovery by the company which allowed them to sacrifice members to turn into feral ghouls even before the Great War war had broken out. So the question then becomes, who exactly is Ugletoth? Were feral ghouls a result of this being rather than the war as we previously assumed? And what even is the purpose of these ancient artifacts and creatures that the Dunwich Boars were studying? 
Potentially, something even more harrowing and disastrous than nuclear fallout in winter lurks beneath the shadows in Fallout, and the Dunwich Building may be at the center of this mystery that seems to have been taking place now for millennia. Knowing Bethesda, it's a type of puzzle we may never get all the answers to, and as long as we don't, the Dunwich Building and its company's foundations will forever be shrouded in secrecy. For some reason, religion seems to be a topic that most games and their characters seldom dive into in any sort of meaningful manner. It's almost like developers are scared to talk about it, or when they do, it seems so hollow and uninteresting. But there is one character that against the odds gives us an impression of faith and belief that might just have you wondering too. And that character is Joshua Graham from the Fallout New Vegas DLC Honest Hearts. You originally get to the start of this questline by traveling to Zion Canyon National Park in Utah, where you are met with a band of warring tribes and feral outlaws alike. You have the White Legged Savages, who are killing in service to Caesar's Legion, one of the main factions from the base game who harbor slaves and all serve a dogmatic dictator named Caesar, battling against the Sorrows and the Dead Horse tribe members, who specifically are led by a man named Joshua Graham. When you first meet Joshua though, he is checking dozens of guns on a table, and he asks that you help him out against the White Leg people, a seemingly very personal mission of his own. But while talking with Graham, you also notice many other things as well. For one, his entire body is covered in bandages. He suffers in pain every moment of his life, and due to strict religious beliefs and doctrines, refuses to take medical chems to shroud the pain beneath him. And later on down the quest line, if you inquire more about this, he explains that he once worked under Caesar, and committed heinous acts of violence and destruction, all in the name of a cause worth nothing. When younger, he left his religious sect of new Canaanites in the world and stumbled upon Caesar before he was even known by that name, and was swept up by his charismatic leadership. But because of mistakes he made, he was betrayed. Caesar kills Joshua's family in front of him and sets him on fire, throwing him down a massive canyon and breaking his bones. However, in these final moments for Joshua, he he had only one thing to rely on to save him, the love of God and of his people. So by some strange miracle or happenstance of faith, Joshua manages to rise from his broken and flame-ridden body, surviving and finding faith again as a new Canaanite, an analogy to the Mormons in our real life, and returns back to his original people, after which he takes an oath to his God that he will serve in his name forever and never become lost again. He forgave those who wronged him, and in turn was forgiven for his own sins, given another chance at life, living by the creed of his people that by giving into the word of God and his laws, they can be given eternal salvation in the end. Despite this horrifying story though, by the time you meet him, Joshua still seems to be driven, at least in part, by that rage and need for revenge like before. In fact, at the very end of the DLC, Joshua even asks that you stand by his side as you slaughter countless members of the White Leg tribe leading the Dead Horse and Sorrows people in an all-out assault on the tribe with thoughtless killing in your and Joshua's wake. And after fighting your way into the heart of this enemy territory, you are met by their fearsome leader, Salt Upon Wounds, who now cowers in the face of Joshua on his knees, just like Joshua did so many years ago. But Joshua in his hate-fueled rage wants nothing more than revenge, and it's only if you have a high enough speech skill that you can talk him out of it and lead yourself down the path of the best ending to the DLC, where Joshua comes to his senses and realizes that he is wrong, that only by putting his faith in a god he believes in so deeply will the white leg peoples and their leaders truly be met with what they deserve. So he looks at salt in the wound in the eyes and lets him go all while the canyon returns to some semblance of normalcy, with at least a partial version of the sorrows and other innocents still intact. Only by remaining strong in his faith, in his absolute devotion to God, even in the face of people who support the killers of his own family and body alike, can Joshua find true salvation. And it's this story and Joshua's character that show so perfectly the deepest struggles of faith, of believing in a God when it feels like he has at points abandoned you or turning the other cheek when your most hated enemy gets to walk and see another day after slaughtering so many of those you love.
love. Because you see, faith isn't an easy thing. But as Joshua shows, it's something that can lead to a life of even greater purpose and also more love and happiness in a world even when it's devoid of it almost entirely. And as someone that's not even religious myself, what a powerful message that is. But I'll let Joshua have the final words, with his best quote from the entire DLC and one that speaks volumes more than the rapid nature in which it's spoken could ever express. I have been baptized twice, once in water, once in flame. I will carry the fire of the Holy Spirit inside until I stand before my Lord in judgment. If you've played any of the mainline Fallout games, you've likely at some point in your travels stumbled upon this absolute stud, otherwise known as the Mysterious Stranger. And just as the name would imply, he truly is quite elusive. In the first and second Fallout games, the isometric ones from Black Isle Studios and Interplay, the Stranger will appear periodically in your travels as either a man or a woman, usually in dire times of need helping you vanquish enemies. But if you try to talk to the individual afterwards, they will always ignore you or simply state that they're there to protect and will not talk. In Fallout 3 in New Vegas, you can once again find this mysterious stranger, but this time in all their 3D glory and also sporting a special Magnum pistol, which when holstered and unholstered plays a little western jingle, probably a nod to the detective noir and western vibes that the character gives off. And finally, in Fallout 4 and 76, we once again will stumble upon the mysterious stranger frequently, willing to help us out either when going down in battle or watching from afar over our most important moments. However, most most peculiar of all, despite seeing this trench coat loving maniac throughout multiple games that take place over hundreds of years, we're no closer to figuring out the real identity of this figure. What we do have though is a lot of odd evidence. First of all, in Fallout New Vegas we're able to meet a man named the Lonesome Drifter, who if we inquire about more will tell us that he was abandoned by his dad at a young age and forced to figure out how to survive with his mother. It's something that we would expect to be commonplace in the dystopian world of Fallout, and thus it's not very notable at first. But where things get extremely interesting is if we actually look at the pistol the Lonesome Drifter is holding, none other than the mysterious stranger's prized magnum sporting the same exact western rift from before. Trying to get more information about this out of the Lonesome Drifter doesn't lead us very far, but it still does give us a big hint that the mysterious stranger is likely this man's father and that he for some reason abandoned his family to presumably watch over you. But the man's secret identity doesn't stop there, because if we look at the Fallout official game guide, things get even more crazy. In the pages of this helpful companion to the game, we are told that the mysterious stranger is an angel-like figure of sorts, who stalks the player and assures their survival, and even more horrifyingly, is also not listed as a man, but an unknown being. But how could this be the case? After all, isn't the mysterious stranger the father of the lonesome drifter, who is a real human being? Well, in Fallout 4, if we investigate some of Nick Valentine's secret stash of intel, we can come across a page he has gathered on the mysterious stranger himself, where he notes how he is always one step ahead and lurking in the shadows. And here Nick makes the impressive guess that the mysterious stranger might actually be the mysterious stranger multiple men and women that are part of a shadowy organization. And yet, even with all this, we still have no idea who this man, woman, or thing really is. Multiple theories in the community have sprung up ranging from vault tech scientists from the future trying to time travel to ensure we survive and enable some big event, secret enclave members that have a vested interest in the player character, all the way down to the mysterious stranger being Santa Claus, who had to figure out something else to do after he could no longer deliver presents around the world for Christmas. And yes, the theory actually has some compelling evidence to back it up. But maybe the most likely theory based on all of the evidence we have before us is that the mysterious stranger as his name implies, is something we cannot fully understand. Potentially the figure could be an eldritch being of sorts that for some reason has taken an interest in us as the player, and maybe is even trying to break the fourth wall in order to communicate with us in the real world somehow. Bethesda probably won't ever give us a definitive answer though, and I think that's for the better. After all, the fear of the unknown, or mysteries that keep us on the edge of our seat, well that, that's what makes games and their deep lore so interesting in the first place, and sometimes never getting answers is so much more satisfying than having everything explained to you as weird as that sounds.